I want to share with you a couple of verses that I'm sure you're familiar with. In your Bibles, please turn to Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Maybe we'll take a little different look at these verses, and I hope it helps and encourages you greatly. It's a great, amazing prophecy written by Isaiah 720 years before Jesus was born. And it's all about the Messiah and who he is and will be. It says, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Prince of peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal, the passionate desire of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Dear God, we just thank you because obviously you have given this child who was born, this son, the very son of God, as a gift to the world. God, we're so grateful. Lord, maybe some don't know him in these ways that you want them to know him. Lord, you are the perfect governor and leader of our lives as well as the rescue, rescuer of our souls, the Savior and Lord. So we invite your spirit to speak to us now. In your precious name, amen. I love that first part that says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government, the government will be upon his shoulders. I love that. You know, when I was a student in high school, we studied the Roman and Greek mythological gods. And, and I was fascinated by it. And my favorite mythological god was Atlas, the Titan god. You know, because he was always holding up the world. Right? And you would see they would show art. Uh, sculptors and paintings and things. And he was holding up the world. He was holding up the world. And the thing that I was really drawn to was he was hugely muscular, which you get a big workout when you're lifting the world, you know? And, and his, his pectoral muscles and his triceps and biceps, they were so huge, and his deltoids. And, and he was just like this. And I was thinking, you know, I want to be like that. And it's never happened. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. We can't carry the world. Sometimes you hear people say, don't bear the burdens of the world on your heart, your mind. But that's what we're doing a lot of times. We're trying to carry all these burdens. And you know, life has a lot of burdens. Like I was saying earlier, our families many times have burdens. And there's so much anxiety and fear in this world. So much worry. And sometimes it is exacerbated when you have great expectation at Christmas. And so it, it, be, it can become even worse. It's actually a time when mental illness increases greatly because of the expectations and the challenges that there are. But we as people were not meant to bear this burden. That God gave us this, this great Savior, this Lord, this Messiah, the Savior of the world. 
And he's the one that carries the world and the burdens on his shoulders. He's the one that came with God's government. The kingdom. He's the king. He's the king in the kingdom. And wherever he went, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here because the king was there. We have a tendency in our nation to think that government is the solution to the problems. We think, you know, we've got all these problems. We've got economic problems. Oh, I hope Trump can solve it. You know, and others were saying, oh, I hope Hillary can solve it. Well, maybe it'll get better. Maybe it won't. I don't know. We've had a lot of presidents. Things have gone up and down and there's this and there's that. And once one solves some problems, they create many more. And then the next guy comes to solve those. So humans can't solve all the problems, but there's not just economic. There's racial problems. You know, there's drug problems, there's broken homes, there's all these things. And sometimes we think the government, the politicians are the answer, but has a Democrat or a Republican come, to, come along and solved it all? No, and things don't change a super lot. Now, I think it's a great thing to be responsible as a citizen and, and vote and seek out the best candidates. I think that's great. I mean, you guys had someone with a lot of muscles, Schwarzenegger, for a while, right? <laughs> Did he, was he able to solve all California's problems? No. And again, I'm not putting down politicians. I'm just saying God has sent a governor. God has sent Jesus. Do you know, ultimately, his kingdom will come. We pray for that. It may be sooner than we think. We may be caught up to be with him. But even if we're not, guess what? He wants to take the throne of your heart. Because number one, he's the king of hearts. He wants to rule in your heart. He wants the peace of God to rule in your heart. And that's why it tells us in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything. Let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, in the rule, under the care of Christ Jesus. You know, I love that command. Worry about nothing. I love that. Do you know that God doesn't want you to worry about anything? Think of that. He wants you worry free. How many are worry-free today? Yeah, I didn't think there were many. But yet that's a command. Be anxious, worry about nothing. Now, the only way that you can worry about nothing is if you obey the next command. Pray in everything. Those commands go hand in hand. You can only worry about nothing if you're casting all your worries on him, which Peter told us to do, right? Cast all your worries, all your cares, all your anxieties. Pray in everything. Everything? Like when you're brushing your teeth? Pray? Mundane things? You know, I mow the lawn at our, at our house and... That's a time when, like, my brain doesn't really have to do or think. So I think about a lot of things. And when I'm mowing the lawn, I think about people that I can't stand. <laughs> you know? And I'm a pastor. So that, that is just not a good, you know, <laughs> attitude or behavior. At all. But I noticed that was happening. 
And, and, and the Lord spoke to me one day and he said, didn't I say pray about everything and pray in everything? I don't like your attitude when you mow the lawn because <laughs> you're thinking all these bad thoughts. I want you praying and talking to me. And if a bad thought or something comes into people's mind, your mind about people, because maybe they've hurt you or said or done or whatever, I want you praying for them. I want you praying for them. I didn't bring them into your mind for you to criticize, but for you to lift them up. Have you ever thought they might have some serious problems? And you're called to help. <laughs> and the first thing is to pray. Anyway, the whole point being that I, now I don't even worry when I mow the lawn. I love it. And I don't get bitter and I don't have hatred anymore. Now I mow the lawn with love. <laughs> yeah. It's so awesome. It's, it's lifted my heart. I just love it. So pray in everything. Prayer, remember, isn't just for one time of the day. It's for any and all times of the day. Talking to God, giving it to the Lord. His rule and his kingdom in your life will grow more and more. It will increase, it says. We just read that. And it'll have no end. No end. It's eternal. That's the beauty of the kingdom of God, isn't it? It's eternal. Now, these names for Jesus... Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All of these are areas in our life that we really need and are part of his government. Let's start out with the first one, Wonderful. Now, sometimes people say he's a wonderful counselor, and he is a wonderful counselor, but that's the next one. Wonderful, actually, in Hebrews, is a noun. It's not an adjective. He's not saying wonderful counselor. What he's saying is he works wonders. He's full of wonders. That's what that word means. He's a miracle man. And the wonders that he does, the greatest wonders that Jesus Christ does are the wonders he does in transforming our lives. And that's what we've been, you know, our, your great worship leader, Amy and Dan, have been talking about that transforming power. He wants to do wondrous things in your life, no matter what it is. He has this incredible power. You see, God is not only amazingly compassionate and caring and kind and, and merciful and all of those things. He just happens to be omnipotent. All powerful. He, he's omniscient. He has all wisdom. And he's omnipresent. So no matter where you're at, he's there and he's been there before you got there. Even if it's way down low in some place, he's there. Like, like David said in one of the Psalms, if I go, you know, to the deepest sea, he's there. If I go to the highest place, he's there. If I, you know, any place I go, he's there. God's there. And he's powerfully wanting to do work in your life. There's no circumstance or difficulty or challenge or trial or temptation that hasn't come along where he doesn't want to show himself sufficient for you. Every single thing that comes into your life, I'm convinced and persuaded that he wants to show you his love and his care over your life. Paul, that's why Paul became persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor highs, nor lows, nor things present, nor things to come, nor any other created thing. He listed all these things because they were part of the things that he was facing regularly. He said, who will separate me from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? What were those things? That was his biography. In the end, he died with the sword. His head was chopped off. But he became persuaded in all those things that nothing could separate him from the love of Jesus because it was always there. 
Even when, like he started with, death can't separate us. Even when he may have faced death, real death. Because if you study Paul's life and you look in the book of Acts, and you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, at least 14 times he should have died. That's what I came up with studying that. One time he may actually have died because he was stoned in Lystra. Right? And, and the enemies who were stoning him, they thought he was dead. His friends who were watching him be stoned thought he was dead. They were standing around him grieving and praying. And it's interesting because... He wrote about that time in his ministry in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he talked about how there was a time where he was caught up to the third heaven. And you, you study the timing and it was seemingly right about that same time. So he may have died and his soul and spirit went to heaven and and usually if your spirit and soul leave your body, you're dead, right? But then what if it comes back in? You know, doctors talk about being clinically dead, right? And then people come back alive. And so they weren't really dead. They were only mostly dead. Because God says when you're dead. And in this case, he let Paul, he said, I went into paradise, the third heaven. I heard inexpressible things, glorious things, not even lawful to speak. It's so amazing. In other words, he went through a terrible, horrendous experience, but it ushered him into paradise to experience paradise of God's love. None of us really wants to die or and that's a good desire to not want to die. You know, we don't mind death. It's just the process, you know. I just want to die in my sleep peaceful. You know, oh, yeah, hi, heaven. Well, we don't know how we're going to go. But you know what? You can be confident that it'll never separate you from his love. But it'll only usher you into an eternity of his love. So this wonderful God conquered death. This Savior not only died for your sins, he rose again. And his victory is a gift to all of us. All of us. Because he was God, a child was born of a virgin, Amy read. You know, when, when Angel Gabriel told Mary, you're going to have a son. Well, wait a second, I'm not married. I am betrothed, but I'm not married. Right? Well, then how can this be? How can I, how can I have a son? Well, the power of the Almighty will overshadow you. And the presence of the Holy Spirit will envelop you. So that that holy offspring that will be conceived in you will be called the son of the living God. Whew. All right. Okay, let it be done. As the Lord says. And she accepted it. A virgin. That's amazing. And the Lord had to convince Joseph, right? I mean, how's Mary going to tell him? It's not what you think. <laughs> it's not another man. It's God. That's kind of fishy. But the Holy Spirit and the angel in a dream, Joseph was dreaming, hey, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Okay. I won't put her away secretly then, because I'm a just man. I wanted to do that, you know. But she didn't do anything wrong. So you don't put her away at all, because it's the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're good. 
And God did it. He did an incredible thing. And it showed in how he lived his life. He did constant miracles for people and helped them. But the ultimate miracle was he was born to die. Do you know Jesus is the only one who's come to this earth that was born to die? That's his main purpose, to die for the sins of mankind. If you don't hear one other thing, listen to this. Isaiah said in another place, Isaiah 53, 10, it pleased the Lord to crush him. God the Father had Jesus crushed. Why? That he might be an offering for your sins and my sins. Bringing him to grief that he might be an offering. Read it, Isaiah 53, 10. It's sobering. But he did that out of love, such love for you. And if he did that of, out of love to save you, if he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for you all, how will he not also with him freely give you all things? That's amazing. You know, I know a few of you guys, I love you guys, but not that much. <laughs> I wouldn't give my sons to die, but Jesus did. There's no one who loves you like Christ. If you don't know this God, if you don't know this amazing Savior, you're missing out on the most important thing in life. He's wonderful. Amen. And he's a counselor. He's a counselor. And if you abide in his word, once you come to know him, if you abide in his word, you'll know the truth. And the truth will set you free over and over again. Over and over again. Like we have a lot of things that we pick up. Baggage. Like Amy picked up. God had to free her. God's freed me. I used to be really mean and harsh. Now I'm extremely kind. And it's all the Lord. I mean, one time I said to my wife, I am so unhappy. I'm just so unhappy. And she said, well, why? And I said, because of you. <coughs> Think of that. That stinks. That's the worst thing a husband could do. Say that. That's what I felt. And it was so great because she, she responded, well, Pastor Wayne, um, <laughs> I just heard a message from a great pastor. I think it was you last Sunday. You said that it's the Lord's job to fulfill our lives. You can't fulfill someone's life. Only God can do it. Kind of like Amy just said. That's what I heard you say. I mean, if you're not happy, isn't that something between you and God? I love that. That was so good. I said, hon, that's the best message I've heard in a long time. And I receive it. I am so sorry. And from that time, I began to realize I've got anger problems. You know, I've got problems. I'm not going to the Lord as much as I should. I'm not yielding over certain things. And it's been a gigantic help. His word began to change areas. And that's all that he wants to continually do. He will make you so much more of the person God, that will please God if you will yield over. You won't have to be a jerk of a husband anymore. You won't have to be a, you know, a wife that, you know, just is frustrated all the time or whatever the issue might be. Counselor, the everlasting father, which is literally the father of eternity. God created eternity. He's the only totally eternal one. He's always been from eternity past to eternity future. But he created eternity and he created us. We fell to sin, 
But now he came and redeemed us on the cross and resurrection. And he wants to give you eternal life. What is eternal life? To know the eternal one. To know God. To have a relationship with God. That's eternal life. John 17, 3. To know God and Jesus Christ, whom God has sent, that's eternal life. Have to have this relationship that is the ultimate. It's not just last life that lasts forever. It's abundant life. It's an abounding relationship of interacting with God and being filled and representing and shining for God. It's just a joy. Not without problems and struggles, but... And then it says the Prince of Peace. We already talked about that. Giving him all your cares, all your burdens. So let me just end with this. He also said the mighty God. You thought I forgot that one, right? I didn't. I wanted to save it for last. Because in Hebrew, it's El Gibor. It means God of power. Or God of the mighty champion, Jesus, the Messiah, is God. If Jehovah's Witness ever talked to you, oh, he's not God. It says here he's the mighty God. El Gabor, God, the mighty champion. That is the Messiah. That's Jesus. You know, a good picture of the Messiah is David fighting Goliath. The story of David and Goliath is not a story saying you can be David and slay a million Goliaths. No, it's about one man who slayed the giant for the whole nation. That's the story of David and Goliath. The greater son of David, the eternal king, Jesus, he came like a David. Right? Just a very humble man. No one would have thought. But think of David. He came to the camp of the Israelites. He came to bring them food. He gave his brothers food. It was great. And then he heard this guy screaming out there, Hey, you Israelites! Big old brawny guy, nine foot six. He had a spear. Just profaned, he was saying, come on, fight me. I'm the champion of the Philistines. Send out your champion. Whoever wins, they get to rule. Come on, you chickens. He's, every day he's doing this, you know. And David's going, who's that guy? And his brothers go, oh, he's, you know, he's a Philistine. He asked around, what's, what's going on here? Hey, if you defeat Goliath on behalf of Israel, you'll get the king's wife plus the throne. You'll get all this in here. It'll, it'll be amazing. He goes, really? See, all of this is what Jesus has gotten. His bride. Well, David's like, what about Saul? He, shouldn't he go out there and do it? No, he's scared too. <laughs> so David says, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going out there. He goes and picks up five smooth stones. He takes his, his slingshot. And he starts going and he's running. And he runs. He runs towards the guy. And he's screaming. The guy's telling him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dismember you. David's running towards him. And finally, he goes, phew. He throws that thing better than, what's that pitcher's name? Kershaw? Yeah. It's even better. Right between the eyes. David, boom, knocks him down. He falls down. He comes and he grabs Goliath's big, huge sword. And he chops off his head. He picks up the guy's head and he walks around with it, showing that victory. And that's how you get ahead.
You know, the very first prophecy of the Messiah was the seed of the serpent will strike your heel, but the seed of the woman will crush his head, crush his authority. The devil will not be able to have any more authority over you or in your life. And the flesh will fall before the power of the spirit that he gives you. This is the victory of Jesus that he loves to give to each of us. And he wants to give to you. This is our Messiah. 